appreciate what a, what a, a wonderful and very beavery uh, part of the, the world New England is. I'm sure there are lots of people out there with lots of, uh, lots of beaver experience, and I'm looking forward to hearing about that um, during the, the Q&A. Uh, so tonight I'll be talking a lot about beavers as tools of ecological restoration that transform landscapes in, in ways that are really beneficial uh, for the environment. But I thought I'd just begin by establishing some basic beaver facts. What, what are beavers uh, exactly and why do we care about them? Uh, so beavers, of course, as many of you know, uh, are rodents, right? They're North America's largest rodent. Uh, 40 to 50 pounds is a typical uh, adult beaver. So they're pretty, pretty hefty animals. Um, and they're semi-aquatic rodents, which means they spend pretty much all of their lives in and around water. Uh, and they've got all of these wonderful features for this unique semi-aquatic niche they fill. Uh, they've got incredibly dense fur, so one of the densest, thickest pelts in the animal kingdom. They've got as many individual hairs on a postage stamp size patch of skin uh, as we have on our entire heads. Uh, and of course, you know, those, those dense pelts were ultimately their downfall, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they've got webbed duck-like hind feet, right? They're very powerful, agile swimmers. Uh, they can stay underwater for up to 15 minutes, so they're champion breath holders. Uh, they've got a second set of transparent eyelids that act like goggles, uh, as well as a second set of lips, um, kind of this fur-lined valve that can close behind their front teeth, which allows them to chew and drag branches underwater uh, without drowning. I think that's a really cool adaptation. Uh, and then what's the beaver's most recognizable, iconic feature? What makes a beaver identifiably a beaver? Uh, the tail, of course, right? Uh, the tail provides all kinds of different functions. Um, it's an alarm system, right? I'm sure that many of you have heard the smack of a beaver's tail hitting the water, uh, which they do to warn other beavers about the presence of predators. Uh, it's a rudder while they swim. It's a kickstand out on land. Uh, it's a fat storage device. So beavers actually put on fat for the winter in their tails. Uh, so the tail is doing all kinds of cool things. Uh, and then the other classic beaver feature, of course, is their teeth, right? Beavers have uh, these wonderful sort of chisel-like incisors that basically file each other down uh, into points. Uh, and the teeth, as you can see, are, are orange. Uh, and the reason for that is that beaver's teeth are actually sort of chemically and structurally fortified with iron uh, that beavers derive from their food, which gives them very uh, durable, powerful teeth, which is important, uh, of course, when you spend your whole life cutting down trees, right? Uh, beavers fell trees um, for two reasons. The first is that they, they eat the cambium, which is the inner bark uh, of trees. Uh, you know, beavers are what scientists call choosy generalists. They've got a few species of tree that they prefer, uh, generally trees in the, in the poplar family, but you know, they'll take just about any deciduous tree. They do tend to avoid conifers. Uh, and they, you know, they eat lots of sort of green, uh, you know, herbaceous vegetation as well, you know, cattails and water lilies and wildflowers and, you know, you name it, beavers, beavers eat it. They are totally herbivorous though. They don't eat fish at all, um, which you guys probably know as, as Mainers. Um, so of course, in addition to uh, cutting down trees to eat that cambium, that inner bark, they're also using the wood as construction material, right? And uh, beavers build two basic types of structures, uh, which many of you have probably seen. Um, the first is the beaver lodge. That's kind of the basic beaver housing unit. Um, you can sort of see in this picture, there are uh, underwater tunnels um, that lead up into the lodge. Inside the lodge, you've got kind of an elevated nesting platform or chamber. Uh, and inside the lodge, you've got the colony or the family. And that's typically two to as many as eight beavers. So you've got the, the male and female, the monogamous mating pair, um, the baby beavers, the kits, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. You've got three year classes of offspring all cohabitating together uh, sometimes. And then during their second year, you know, those teenagers will disperse out looking for their own territories, you know, like, yeah, teenagers heading off to, heading off to college or, or something like that. Um, somebody did ask in the chat uh, about beavers that live in, in big bodies of water. Um, and, you know, there they, they will, they'll just tunnel into the river banks uh, and live very happily in, in bank burrows. So not all beavers live in these big conspicuous, you know, island lodges. They do live in the banks very, very happily sometimes. So mission to the lodge, you know, the other basic beaver construction is the dam, right? Uh, so why do beavers build dams? What's the point of this 
really unique, strange, specialized behavior. Well, a beaver out on land uh, is, as one biologist put it to me, a big, slow, smelly package of meat, right? And uh, beavers get eaten by, you know, any large carnivore, uh, black bears uh, and coyotes in, in Maine, you know, out, out here in uh, Eastern Washington, we've also got cougars and, uh, and wolves, um, you know, which would love to eat a beaver. Um, so, you know, by, by building that dam and creating this nice deep pool of water, right? Beavers are basically expanding their own shelter uh, and, and increasing the size of their habitat, right? So instead of having to walk overland uh, to that good looking aspen tree and maybe get eaten by a, a bear on the way, they can swim to it instead and, uh, and be relatively safe. So beavers are just, you know, they're just expanding their own habitat. Um, and here's a picture of a, uh, a beaver that was eaten by a wolf in Minnesota, um, I believe I found this. And, uh, you know, and, and um, when, uh, when a wolf eats a beaver, it actually eats the pelt, bones and all, and just leaves the, the mandible and the lower incisors. So, you know, just the, the takeaway there is you don't, you don't want to be a beaver on land, right? That's what, that's what happens to beavers when they spend too much time on land. You want to stay in the water. Uh, so a typical beaver colony is building you know, one primary dam and then a number of smaller secondary dams, you know, maybe uh, in some cases, you know, 10 to 15 dams in all. Um, and these dams come in all, kind, all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, here's a, a nice, uh, you know, three foot long, one foot tall secondary dam uh, that's, you know, doing a little bit of work on the landscape. Um, but they do get quite a bit bigger. Here's a, a pretty impressive structure, uh, also in Minnesota, that's, uh, you know, probably 15 feet tall and maybe 800 feet long. Um, it's obviously the work of, of many successive generations of beavers, uh, all adding their, their stick to the pile. Uh, so this is, you know, not a typical beaver dam, but it is the kind of thing that they can do uh, when left to their own devices. And some of these beaver dams are impounding or capturing enormous volumes of water, right? Here's a, here's a pond and wetland complex that's basically, you know, maybe 300 acres or so and is formed by a, a single beaver dam, you know, and I'm always impressed. I, I always feel like, you know, if you took an engineer from the Army Corps to a stream and said, okay, build a dam in the spot that's going to minimize labor and maximize the total volume of water impounded. You know, that engineer would choose the exact same spot that the beavers did. Uh, I'm always impressed by their, their hydrological savvy. So in addition to uh, building dams, you know, the other important thing that beavers do that I don't think they get enough credit for is that they also dig these kind of prolific canal networks. You know, they're really wonderful excavators. And again, the point of the canals, similar to uh, the, the dam, you know, is they're just trying to expand that water, right? So instead of having to walk over land, uh, you know, now they can swim up a canal, cut down a tree, float it back down the canal, all without, without leaving the water. And these canal networks, you know, can extend hundreds of feet up into the forest. And, uh, you know, I often see little baby fish and uh, amphibians hanging out in these canals. So I think these are a really important um, landscape feature that beavers create as well as the, the dams. So you put it all together and, you know, here's kind of a, a really classic uh, beaver complex. This is in Colorado, actually. This is at about 12,000 feet uh, up on the Continental Divide. So they really get, you know, way the heck up there. Uh, and you can see, you know, here are all of the, you know, the linear features, right? The beaver dams and, you know, the stream just kind of comes meandering through this valley, uh, you know, and then it hits these, these beaver dams and, you know, just kind of sits in that valley, you know. So here, uh, these dams are capturing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gallons of water uh, and really saturating or, or irrigating uh, this, this little valley here at a, a pretty impressive scale, I think. So, you know, they're just taking this straight stream and making it this beautiful, multifaceted, complex series of ponds and wetlands and meanders and, and braids. So this is, I think, a really good representation of what one of these beaver complexes looks like. So <clears throat> beavers, um, you know, by building dams and digging canals and creating ponds, you know, they're trying to maximize their own habitat, but in the process, they're creating habitat for lots of other creatures as well, right? Um, you know, beavers are what scientists call a keystone species, uh, an animal that is disproportionately supporting a, a lot of weight uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, a few classic beaver beneficiaries. Here's a, a great blue heron rookery uh, at a beaver complex in Wisconsin. Um, so, you know, you guys are birders, of course. Uh, so you understand that, you know, if you want to see birds, where do you go? You go to a wetland, right? Um, so 
you know, waterfowl, wading birds, um, really, you know, every, I mean, lots of species of passerines, songbirds are also uh, really happy around beaver complexes, you know, perched in the coppicing willows or eating the aquatic insects coming off that, uh, that pond. Uh, so, you know, beavers are just wonderful creators of bird habitat. Uh, here's, you know, your state mammal, I, th I think. Um, the moose, uh, here's a moose hanging out in a beaver pond. Um, you know, all kinds of aquatic mammals, you know, muskrat, otters, mink, uh, all love, love beaver complexes. Um, and then fish, you know, are the other kind of another classic beaver beneficiary. Uh, this is a, a juvenile rainbow trout, which are native out here in Washington. And, uh, you know, if you're a baby fish, right, you don't want to live in the main stem, free flowing, fast moving river, uh, you know, you'll just get blown downstream, right? You just, you wanna live in the slow side channels, the meanders, the eddies, uh, you know, you want that complex slow water refuge habitat uh, that beavers create so well. Um, and here, you know, of course you guys, uh, well, you know, rainbow trout are a native in Maine, but of course your, uh, your native salmonid is the brook trout. And here's a, a really uh, spectacular brook trout that I, I pulled out of a, a beaver pond. Um, so, you know, any, every salmonid is, is benefiting from the, the, uh, the habitats that beavers create. Uh, of course, one sort of common objection that you hear um, from anglers and even sometimes fish biologists is, you know, wait a second, uh, we're trying to pull dams out of rivers, right? Not put more dams into rivers. You know, I know that you guys, of course, just uh, just pulled the the the, uh, the dam on the, on the Penobscot River. You know, um, so why would you want to introduce more structures uh, that fish have to get past? But you know, of course. Um, Beaver dams and human dams are very different. Uh, fish have no problem whatsoever jumping over beaver dams, wriggling through the woody structure. Um, you know, lots of fish are migrating during periods of high flow when there's water going around the beaver dam. Um, you know, that, I know that this is, uh, you know, this is more anecdote than evidence, but you know, here's a, a nice example on a stream outside of Seattle. Here's the beaver dam, here's the pond up above it. Uh, and here are the two uh, freshly dug coho, coho salmon nests. Um, so clearly two fish had no problem whatsoever getting, getting beyond this obstacle. Uh, and in fact, you know, beavers and salmon are so intimately linked, right? They've been, they've been sort of evolving together for millions of years uh, that they inspired my favorite bumper sticker, uh, which is that beavers taught salmon to jump. I think that that gets at the, the evolutionary connection nicely. Uh, one other important point um, that I, I'd make about beavers, it's, you know, especially applicable uh, in New England, you know, is that beavers are a form of disturbance, right? Uh, you know, you've got these very dense forest canopies, um, you know, they're, they're kind of a lightless forest floor, and, you know, beavers are opening up that canopy uh, and really creating these, you know, these, these, these diverse areas, these little patches on the landscape um, of, you know, of pond and, and wetland habitat. Uh, in this otherwise, you know, kind of monotonous forest scape. So that, that function of, you know, creating disturbance and opening up the canopy, uh, I think is, is really important. So, you know, we, we know that beavers um, historically were much more prevalent on the landscape than they are today, right? You know, I know that in Maine, it probably feels like there are beavers everywhere. And, you know, beavers are not an endangered species, right? There are, you know, maybe 10 to 15 million beavers in North America. We don't know exactly how many, which, you know, sounds like a lot uh, until you consider that you know, they're really at a tiny fraction of their historic abundance. Uh, you know, before Europeans arrived in North America, there were as many as 400 million beavers uh, on, the, on the landscape. Um, and those beavers would have created hundreds of millions of beaver ponds, uh, of course. Um, and, you know, a little bit of back of the envelope math suggests that uh, beavers pre-European arrival impounded something like 230,000 square miles of land, which for reference uh, is basically the size of Arizona and Nevada put together. Um, so beavers, you know, were this remarkably prolific animal uh, on the landscape. Uh, and I think that, you know, an important point to remember too is, is that native people had a, a really um, deep and intimate relationship uh, with, with beavers. Um, you know, interestingly, sort of the, the, the native relationship with beavers was, was very sort of regionally specific, right? So on the East Coast, um, you know, many tribes were, were enthusiastic participants in the fur trade um, because, I mean, first they wanted the goods from the fur trade, um, you know, pots and, and knives and, and whatnot. Um, but they also understood that, hey, when you, when you remove beavers from an area, you know, you create this nice lush, 
uh, meadow essentially that's really good foraging habitat for deer that you like to hunt, right? Um, so, you know, removing beavers was a way of engineering the landscape. At the same time, in, you know, in the American West where I live, you know, it's a, a much drier, more arid landscape and, and native people like the Blackfeet uh, understood that beavers created these really important ecological oases uh, on this otherwise arid landscape. And, and thus they had cultural prohibitions um, against killing beavers uh, and refused to take part in the fur trade, you know, which is why guys like, you know, Kit Carson and Jedediah Smith and, and uh, Hugh Glass, uh, you know, all of these famous fur trappers had to go become trappers themselves because native people wouldn't do their dirty work in, in the West. So, you know, I think that that, you know, I'll be talking tonight a lot about sort of, you know, how we're coming to use beavers as these ecological restoration tools. But, you know, that's not an understanding that's new to Western science, right? That's something that native people have known for a very long time, uh, that these animals are incredibly important ecosystem engineers. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I tried to do working on this, is, this book was, was to reconstruct what a landscape with its full complement of beavers might have, might have looked like. Uh, and there were just some really incredible records, you know, explorers diaries and trappers journals and railroad survey reports and native histories, uh, you know, about what this continent might have looked like with its full complement of, of beavers. Um, you know, and you read explore, you read accounts of explorers crossing what is today Indiana uh, and not finding a dry place to camp for a hundred miles because beavers had so thoroughly ponded everything up. Um, you know, Lewis and Clark uh, described seeing beaver dams in every single tributary uh, of the Missouri River, uh, you know, as far as the eye could see up, up into the mountains. So this is just, a, you know, this incredible beaver paradise um, that, of course, you know, we, we destroyed. Uh, you know, the fur trade really begins in the 1600s uh, in New England and in Connecticut and the Hudson Valley and, uh, you know, pr pretty quickly spreads west and south, um, you know, just trapping beavers out of every river, lake, stream, and pond that, uh, that Europeans encountered. Um, and the reason, of course, was for beaver hats, right? I think we often hear the phrase beaver hat and think of like a big fluffy, you know, kind of Davy Crockett uh, type of thing. But in fact, you know, beavers were these elegant Victorian top hats that were all the rage back in Europe. And, uh, you know, really along with timber and cod were the most important economic resource um, that, uh, that Europeans found in the the quote unquote new world. Um, you know, just a few indications of how significant the, the, the beaver trade was economically. Here's the, the city seal of the city of New York, which is still the city, the official city seal today. And uh, here are the two beavers in it. Uh, I think that's a pretty interesting indication. Um, I live out in, in uh, what, it, what, what used to be the Oregon territory, you know, this giant territory that encompassed basically the, the whole of the Northwest. And out here, you know, we had we had what was known as the beaver coin, um, and the value of one beaver coin was fixed to the value of one beaver pelt. So the entire northwestern economy operated on the the beaver pelt standard. And you know, practically every significant historical event prior to the Civil War had some kind of beaver connection. Um, you know, the Revolutionary War, for example, you know, one of the, uh, the British offenses that angered the colonists was denying them access to trapping grounds west of the Appalachian uh, Mountains. And, you know, the, the Louisiana Purchase was partly inspired by Jefferson's desire to secure uh, a new source of beavers. Uh, and of course, you know, the smallpox and other diseases that were spread by so many, uh, you know, fur trappers and traders ended up you know, ravaging Native American tribes. So, you know, the story of the fur trade is really the story of early American history uh, and all of its kind of grandiosity and, and tragedy. So in addition to being this, this hugely significant uh, historical event, you know, the fur trade was also a, a really profoundly impactful ecological event, right? I mean, what happens when you trap out 400 million beavers? Where all, well, all of those, those, uh, those beaver dams break down and all of those beaver ponds drain. Uh, and in fact, you know, in, 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 uh, in New England, so when, when those beaver ponds drained in the, in the 1600s, so much nutrients flowed out of them and into the Atlantic Ocean that it fertilized this enormous algae bloom that then settled out. So today, if you took a, a sediment core in Long Island Sound, you would see this layer of, of diatoms of, of phytoplankton that was fertilized uh, by, the, by this, this beaver bloom, essentially. I think that's a pretty incredible indication of you know, what a geological event this was. Um, and one of the ironies of the fur trade you know, is that it really made 
agriculture possible uh, in New England, you know, right? Of course, New England is, you know, an otherwise uh, pretty inhospitable place for farming, you know, very uh, sort of rocky, infertile soils. Um, but, you know, all of those old beaver pond footprints were perfect agricultural areas, right? They're flat, they're treeless, they're incredibly fertile. Um, so, you know, in some ways, the, it was the trapping of beavers that paved the way um, for, uh, for, for farming. Uh, of course, for other species, uh, you know, the beaver trapping was not nearly so beneficial, right? I mean, one of the, the unfortunate things that happens when you, uh, you know, eliminate beaver dams is that you really change the streams in which those dams occur, right? In a, in a beaver rich stream, you know, all of those beaver dams are acting as speed bumps, spreading out water and, and connecting the stream with the floodplain. Um, but when you lose all of those beaver speed bumps, you know, there's nothing checking the velocity of that stream. And you get this really dramatic uh, down cutting or incision or erosion and the stream separates from the floodplain. Uh, and you know that that lush uh, wetland or wet meadow in the floodplain turns into kind of desiccated pasture land, you know, so I mean, tens of thousands of stream miles in the US uh, ended up degraded um, as a result of, uh, of, of beaver trapping. Uh, and of course, that was, you know, catastrophic for all kinds of different species. Um, here's a boreal toad, which is a, uh, an amphibian that lives out west here. It's basically a, a beaver pond obligate, um, so breeds almost exclusively in beaver ponds. You know, on the East Coast, leopard frogs would have been, uh, you know, really seriously impacted. Uh, and then salmon, you know, I think were the kind of the quintessential um, collateral damage of the, the, the beaver trade. Um, and, you know, in some watersheds out in Washington, where I live, uh, you know, we, we lost 97% of our, our baby coho salmon rearing habitat when we lost beaver ponds. So, you know, I think that we're not accustomed to thinking about uh, the fur trade in the same terms as the deforestation of New England or the busting of the Midwestern prairie as being this really seminal ecological catastrophe, but, you know, there's no question that it was. So, you know, fortunately, by 1900 or so, we start to wise up to recognize that, you know, hey, beavers are, uh, are, are more valuable dead than alive. Uh, and, uh, you know, lots of states around the country have um, had beaver reintroduction programs, uh, you know, mostly using stock from Canadian beavers. Uh, you know, Maine, I think, where, where beavers were essentially wiped out, um, you know, had a lot of natural immigration down from Canada as the, you know, the industrial fur trade uh, kind, of, kind of ended. Um, so all of these states, you know, are engaged in, in kind of re-beavering the landscape in the early 1900s um, and, and restoring these animals. Uh, of course, the most famous beaver reintroduction project um, occurred in Idaho. Uh, in 1948, um, there they wanted to reintroduce beavers to what is today the uh, the Frank Church Wilderness area. Um, first, they tried moving the beavers on horseback. Uh, the horses didn't take very kindly to having a big rodent strapped to them, so they abandoned that idea. But you know, it was 1948. It was just post World War II. Uh, they had all of these airplanes and surplus parachutes on hand, and uh, one of these guys had the bright idea of uh, of air dropping beavers uh, into the backcountry. So that year they, they dropped uh, 76 beavers uh, via parachute. Uh, 75 of the beavers survived. One beaver unfortunately escaped from the crate in midair and fell to his death, very sad. Um, but the next year when they flew back over this landscape, they saw uh, new ponds in every single place where they dropped beavers. So this was actually an incredibly effective and successful restoration project. Uh, nobody's doing uh, beaver airlifting anymore, as far as I know, but, you know, that was certainly uh, impactful at the time. So, you know, throughout the 1900s, beavers are starting to recover. They're moving back into their former habitats, but they're discovering that, hey, you know, in their absence, we have colonized those exact same habitats, right? It turns out that, you know, beavers and humans like to live in the exact same places. You know, we both like these low, uh, sort of low gradient stream corridors and, and nice broad fertile floodplains, right? That's where we like to uh, build our, our infrastructure, our roads and our rail lines and our, our power lines and our towns and our farms. And uh, that's where beavers like to hang out. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd argue that, uh, you know, that we're the, the nuisance species more than they are. Uh, but, you know, there's no question that as beavers start to recover, uh, you know, conflicts become increasingly frequent. Here's a, a set of railroad tracks in, in Massachusetts that I visited uh, in a kind of a Boston suburb. And uh, these tracks, these are, these are, this is a set of, trail, of train tracks that leads to a, a rock quarry. 
uh, and these tracks had just been refurbished, cost it was a, this big million dollar uh, sort of track laying project. And uh, you know, within three months of co the completion of this, this, this set of tracks, uh, beavers had them underwater. Um, so that's the sort of thing they're capable of doing. Um, here's another nice uh, illustration, I think, of beaver conflict. This is a little cabin that I came across in New Mexico. Um, and here you can sort of see um, so the beavers begin their, their dam in the left-hand corner of the screen. They dam to the base of the cabin. Then they incorporate the cabin in their dam and they keep going on the right-hand side. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't want to be that landowner, but you have to admire the, uh, the ingenuity of the beavers in, in that, that instance. Uh, probably the most common cause of beaver conflict in, in North America is damming in road culverts, right? If you're a beaver, you know, the road bed is this wonderful dam. Uh, and then the culvert is the leak in the dam, right? The pipe through which the water is flowing. And, you know, beavers hate leaks, right? They plug up leaks. That's what, that's what they do. Uh, so, you know, the water level rises, the road washes out. That's a, a very common uh, cause of beaver conflict. Um, and then they occasionally get into even more creative trouble. Here's a beaver that broke into a dollar store in Maryland and was uh, browsing the plastic Christmas tree aisle uh, when it was apprehended by the authority. So they get into all kinds of interesting, interesting trouble. And you know, the way that these sorts of beaver conflicts are almost always handled uh, is by trapping out the offending beaver, right? Which makes a lot of sense. You know, the beaver's causing a problem, get the beaver out of there. Uh, so every year, you know, the, the federal government, the agriculture department uh, kills about 20,000 beavers and, uh, you know, private trappers take, you know, certainly tens and probably hundreds of thousands of beavers more. Uh, and, you know, the problem with that kind of reflexive uh, lethal approach to management, I think, is, is twofold. I mean, first, of course, um, when you eliminate the beaver, you're also eliminating potentially that great pond and wetland habitat that, you know, the beaver would otherwise be creating. Uh, but also, you know, all you're doing is opening a, a vacancy for the next family of beavers, right? As long as that, you know, as long as that, uh, that culvert is there uh, attracting them, you know, they're always going to be back. So all of these communities, you know, are engaged in these really expensive cycles of trapping and recolonization and trapping and, and recolonization. So you start to wonder, well, you know, maybe there's a, a better way of, of doing business uh, and, and dealing with these beaver conflicts. Um, so, you know, somebody asked in the chat about, uh, you know, about tree damage and, uh, you know, every year, you know, many, many thousands of beavers are killed for cutting down trees. And, you know, to me, I just don't think that a beaver should ever be killed for cutting down a tree. That's just, you know, too easy a problem to solve uh, with a bit of, a bit of uh, wire fencing. And, you know, check out the, check out the, the Beaver Institute um, for, uh, for kind of design specs uh, about, you know, the kind of the best gauge of wire to use and, and how to install it. Um, so I think this is kind of a cool case study. Incidentally, this is a, uh, this is a, a land trust that uh, had these beautiful old cottonwood trees they wanted to protect. So they fenced off the cottonwoods from the beavers, that's, that's fine. Uh, and then they left unfenced the non-native Siberian elm trees, uh, which the beavers took down. So that's, that's actually invasive vegetation management using beavers. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, so when the, when the problem is flooding, you know, that's, that's you know, somewhat more difficult to solve, but you know, there too, we've got options. This is a, a contraption known as the beaver deceiver um, invented by Skip Lyle, uh, who uh, runs Beaver Deceivers International down in Vermont. Um, Skip actually invented the beaver deceiver while working for the Penobscot Nation uh, in, in Maine. And, uh, you know, and there's a whole, there's a, there are a whole bunch of these, these sorts of devices. Um, you know, the beaver deceiver is sort of one model of this broader category of, of, uh, of things called flow devices. And they all, you know, basically use the same principle. Uh, the idea is that, you know, you pass the, um, the pipe, you know, through the beaver dam or into the road culvert. Uh, you know, you've got these, these fences or cages to basically keep the beavers from plugging up the pipe. Um, and you're just trying to move water from the upstream side of the dam to the downstream side, right? You're, you're just you know, lowering the level of that pond, uh, ideally to a spot that both the, the beavers and the humans can tolerate. Um, so here's the kind of a very, you know, I mean, Skip would probably say this is, this is under, underbuilt uh, and uh, not beaver proof enough. But here, you know, here's a little device that we put in uh, out here in Washington last year. Um, you know, you can see that all of this water is, you know, flowing out of this pond. Um, and, you know, when this picture was taken, this, this pipe had probably been in for an hour or so. And you can see on the tree trunks here, you know, we've, we've already dropped the, the water level uh, by, you know, a foot or so. Uh, and, you know, a year later, 
beavers are still at they're still at this site, um, and you know they'll be the adjacent landowner. Um, you know her property is no longer flooded, so you know every, everybody's happy. Uh, and you know these I mean these sorts of devices might not be appropriate for every single situation. Although Skip I think would say that um, you know there's really no spot where you couldn't use one of these. Um, you know there there have been studies that basically find find these things work. 87 to 97 percent of the time, depending on the situation. So, you know, there's no question uh, that there are thousands and thousands of sites all around the country, and you know, certainly many in Maine, um, a very beavery place where we're currently lethally removing beavers, where we could be, you know, using these more cost-effective, uh, more permanent, uh, and you know, certainly more ecologically sensible uh, methods in, instead. Uh, another option for dealing with beaver conflict, you know, not so prevalent in Maine, just because, um, you know, you guys have a pretty robust beaver population, but, you know, out here in, in the West, you know, we're, we're certainly very far from beaver carrying capacity. So we do a lot of beaver relocation, um, you know, basically live trapping nuisance beavers on private property and uh, moving them to public land. Um, so here's uh, Sandy and Chopper, uh, a nice uh, pair of beavers uh, heading off to their, their new home high up in the national forest. Um, you know, you're always trying to move the beaver family together, right? They're very family oriented animals. So you don't, you know, you, you want to catch, you want to catch and relocate the whole, the whole colony as a unit. Um, in some cases, you know, one of the, the drawbacks of beaver relocation uh, is that um, you know the, you're you're moving the beavers into a, an area that's new to them? They don't have a, a pond and a lodge yet, so they're at, at risk of predation. Um, so in some cases, you know, we like to build them these kind of these starter lodges, essentially that they can move into uh, and and be relatively safe until they can build a, a better lodge of their own. And uh, here's the beaver uh, enjoying his his new uh, his new starter lodge. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not you know different different states have different beaver relocation regulations. I don't, I don't actually know what Maine's uh, regulations are, um, but you know, worth, worth looking into, uh, you know, if you, if you have a, a beaver conflict on your land that, you know, for whatever reason, maybe can't be solved with a flow device, uh, you know, maybe there's an option to live trap and, and relocate that animal uh, non-lethally. But, you know, obviously check with, check with DNR since I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know different states uh, regulations around that. Uh, another thing that we do a lot out, out here in the West, um, you know, le less, less prevalent in the East, but there are some Eastern uh, conservation groups doing this kind of work, are beaver mimicry structures, right? You know, in, in many cases, because a lot of our streams are so eroded and incised, you know, beavers can't establish in them, right? One of, you know, a very, a very eroded stream is like a fire hose just blasting out any dam they, they try to build. So by, by pounding some vertical posts into the stream bed, uh, you know, we can give them a little bit of structure, um, you know, give them something to build off of. So they, they might be inclined to move back into an area uh, where they, they might not be able to otherwise. Um, you know, as you can see, it's a very uh, kind of low tech, uh, low cost restoration technique, doesn't require any kind of, uh, you know, big back hose or, uh, you know, or front loaders or anything like that. Um, and uh, you know the place where this technique was really pioneered uh, was in Oregon. Um, you know there they had a bunch of uh, they had this kind of endangered population of steelhead of rainbow trout they wanted to, to save. Um, so they built uh, 115 beaver dam analogs, these you know artificial beaver dams. Uh, the beavers went crazy. They built 120 dams of their own. Uh, they flooded this huge uh, amount of land, um, and they filled up all of these old side channels. So, you know, you, by, by pushing water out onto the floodplain, you know, they took this single thread stream and they filled up these old side channels and made it this very complex multi-threaded stream. Uh, and all of that additional habitat led to a 50% survival increase in, in baby uh, steelhead salmon or steelhead trout. Um, so that's that's kind of a cool case study. I think that's basically humans and beavers working together to help save this this endangered fish. That's that's that's, that's the kind of restoration project that again is very common out here in the West. Um, you know, not not used uh, quite as much uh, on the East Coast, but you know, there there are some places that are building these these beaver den analogs uh, on the Eastern Seaboard. And here's another example of one that we just we just built. Uh, in uh, on a, a creek out here in uh, in Washington, so this is a you know a new beaver dam analog, just just waiting for the beaver dam for the for the beavers themselves to show up and and make this site really really great habitat. 
So I've, you know, I've been talking a lot about sort of their benefits for, for uh, fish and other species, but what about, what about human benefits? You know, what do beavers do for us uh, as, as, you know, homo sapiens that we might, we might care about? Um, and, you know, there are a few really important ecosystem services that I, I want to highlight. Um, I mean, first, they're, they're just wonderful stream restorers, right? And, and um, you know, out here in the West, as I'm, I'm sure you know, you know, we've just had terrible uh, drought problems. Uh, you know, over the last 20 years or so, we're basically in this kind of chronic state of drought, uh, you know, resulting from climate change. Um, and, you know, it, it starts to look really important, you know, hey, maybe we can, you know, basically take some of these really degraded streams and, you know, use them to store water more permanently, right? Um, so, you know, here's kind of a classic case study in Nevada. They had this very sort of degraded, um, you know, kind of uh, lifeless stream um, as a result of, you know, first beaver trapping followed by uh, sort of unmanaged cattle grazing. And, uh, you know, in this case, you know, nobody, you know, did anything too radical. They just kind of stopped grazing the stream bottom super intensively. And, you know, the cattails and willows started to regrow. And then the beavers kind of magically showed up. You know, they're really good at um, basically finding, a, you know, an available food source on their own. So, you know, here's what the stream looked like in 1980, and uh, here's what it looks like today, um, you know, thanks in large part to the, the work of beavers. You know, and you might look at this and say, well, wait a second, you know, what are, what are beavers doing here? I don't see any beaver dams, but all of this old cattail growth uh, is growth atop a beaver dam. So they're really deeply embedded in this system. And, uh, you know, here, researchers found that beavers added 20 acres of open water to the streams. They created all of these wonderful ponds. Uh, they added three miles of wetted stream length. So what does that mean? Well, when the stream was super degraded like this, it was actually going dry before reaching its confluence with the main river, right? So by slowing water down, beavers basically ensured there would still be water in the stream in you know, August, September, the hot dry season. So basically they took a seasonal stream and made it perennial. I think that's pretty magical and is you know, a great indication of why they're such important drought mitigation tools. Um, they also added two feet to the water table, right? So you know, when you look at a beaver pond, there's all of the visible surface water uh, that you see. But what you don't see is the weight of that pond forcing water into the ground, recharging aquifers, hydrating the soil, raising that water table. Uh, and that's what beavers are doing at a pretty, a pretty massive scale. So here, you know, they, they basically irrigated a hundred more acres of, of stream side vegetation. And they basically just, yeah, they sub irrigated this entire stream corridor. And uh, that's a pretty big deal for, for guys like this. This is a, a dude named James Rogers. He's a rancher uh, out there in Nevada. <coughs> you know, and the point that he made to me is that beavers basically increased the forage production for his cattle tenfold, right, through their irrigation services, uh, you know, which means more weight on his cows and more money in his back pocket. So now out there in, you know, eastern Nevada, very dry place, there's this wonderful cluster of, of pro beaver ranchers uh, who have seen what these animals can do. I think, I think that's pretty cool. <clears throat> So out here, you know, in the West, we're experiencing these really bad droughts. But on the East Coast, you know, you have the opposite problem, right? You're, you know, you have more intense rain events um, because of climate change, uh, you know, leading to to flooding. Um, but there too, you know, beavers have this really important role to play, right? Beavers, you know, by building dams and creating ponds and wetlands, they're basically capturing all of this you know, storm water, all of this runoff, right? So you get a really big rain event and that water hits, uh, you know, a series of beaver ponds and it, you know, it's, it's captured in the pond or it sinks into the ground or it spreads out laterally onto the floodplain. Uh, you know, so there have, been, there have been studies showing that beavers capture 30% or they're, they're capable of capturing 30% uh, of any given big rainfall event. Uh, which is pretty amazing. So this is a picture I took in Scotland, um, where you know, the Scottish government is reintroducing Eurasian beavers um, as a, a as a, a flood uh, as a flood mitigation tool uh, on a very rainy landscape. So you know I think that's pretty incredible to contemplate, right? You've got these two opposite problems: drought and flood, uh, and beavers are are helping us tackle both of them. I think that's pretty magical. Uh, another really important service is, is pollution capture, right? You know, you get a big, you know, you get a stream kind of running, running down river, uh, you know, and then it hits that beaver dam and the water slows down and it drops out all of the suspended solids, you know, all of the nitrates and phosphorus and sediment. Um, 
and uh, you know that and that stuff basically settles out and is is entrained or captured in the pond. And here, you know, you can see this really nice thick layer of you know organic matter that's built up uh, behind this beaver dam over over many years. Um, so you know there have been studies finding beavers capture you know, 100 tons of sediment. And this is a single pair of beavers. Two beavers captured 100 tons of sediment over several years. They sequestered 15 tons of carbon, right? So they're storing lots of carbon. Uh, and they also captured a, a ton of nitrogen pollution. Um, so now, you know, beavers are being used as a restoration tool in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, you know, one of the most agriculturally impacted bodies of water in the world, you know, where every summer this big dead zone uh, forms in Chesapeake Bay. Um, which is basically, you know, the result of all of this agricultural uh, effluent, um, and beavers are, are helping to capture some of that and, and mitigate uh, that that pollution. So that that idea of beavers as, as sort of pollution mitigation devices is really really driving a lot of beaver restoration uh, on the East Coast. And then, you know, the final um, sort of key beaver service that I wanted to highlight here, you know, which is really especially relevant for us in the West, uh, is they're great firefighters, right? You know, they, they spread water out and water doesn't burn. Uh, and you can see here's just a, you know, beautiful illustration of this, this point. You know, here's a fire in Idaho a few years ago. Uh, and the only, you know, green, wet, blue, lush place on the landscape is that, that beaver influenced valley bottom. So beavers, you know, in, in, in some places they've really stopped fire in its tracks and created these amazing fire breaks. Uh, so that, that idea, you know, beavers as, uh, as firefighters is really important. And actually, you know, Skip Lyle has shown me pictures of, of, uh, of firefighters um, in New England using beaver ponds as water sources, you know, dropping, I mean, helicopters, you know, dipping their, their big buckets in, in beaver ponds and uh, putting out fires that way. So, you know, really any, anywhere you are in the country, beavers are, are playing this firefighting role. So, you know, given all of the wonderful services I've been talking about, you know, you, you might be wondering, well, wait a second, why, I mean, given, given how great beavers are, why do we still kill so many of them? You know, why, why don't, why are we more uh, amenable to beavers? And, you, you know, I think, I think that the, the reason for that is, you know, is a failure of, of historical ecological imagination, right? I mean, you know, when we killed 400 million beavers uh, several hundred years ago, you know, we changed North American streamscapes in ways that we don't fully understand, right? And we kind of internalized this notion, I think, of a healthy stream being this, you know, free-flowing, fast-moving, cobble-bottomed uh, thing that, you know, you, you could just, you know, leap or, or wade right across. You know, this is the sort of stream you might see in the, you know, an, a, an Orvis catalog or a Field and Stream magazine, um, when in reality, you know, we know that many, many ecosystems looked more like this, right? There was water everywhere. There were dead and dying trees all over the place. You know, the bottom of the pond was kind of mucky rather than uh, gravel or cobble, uh, probably smelled pretty funky. Um, you know, so I don't think you would necessarily see this in a, you know, in a fly fishing magazine. But, um, you know, I think that uh, in, in many, many cases, this sort of landscape was more rule than exception thanks to beavers. So if we're going to fully uh, embrace beavers, you know, we have to, we have to reconceptualize uh, what our, our landscapes historically looked like and what they should look like today. Uh, and, you know, I just wanted to, here's you know, one sort of one illustration, a, kind of a recent headline from a, a, a newspaper in New York where, you know, after the, the beavers returned uh, to Staten Island, you know, they were, they were perceived as wreaking havoc uh, and, you know, one of the local landowners said, well, it was, you know, it was, it was never a lake before, right? It used to be this, you know, free flowing, fast moving stream. And now, now there's water everywhere and they've cut down all of these trees. But, you know, again, we have to, we have to internalize the idea that that sort of beaver work uh, is, is more, is normal and natural and, and healthy. And really, you know, what a lot of these, these systems look like historically. So to sum it all up, you know, we've got this wonderful rodent, uh, this wonderful animal that provides us all of these uh, incredible ecological services, both for humans and for other species. It does it all for free. And uh, best of all, it doesn't need permits, right? So as the, the mantra of the beaver believer goes, uh, it's time to get out of the way and uh, let the rodent do the work. That's, that's uh, I'm gonna get that tattooed on me someday. Um, so with that, I'll say uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, we, we have some time for questions. Um, I did write this book about this, uh, this subject. Um, always happy to uh, send you a signed copy if you're interested um, or just to talk about beavers uh, moving forward. So there's my email address. Um, I'll put it in the chat too. Um, and um, yeah, we can take some questions. Yeah. Hi, Ben, that was great. Um, <laughs> we have several questions already. 
And I'd like to start with um, what is the typical lifespan of beavers and how large are their families or colonies? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so, you know, in the, the, the oldest beaver I've, I've heard of them kept in captivity is 19 years old uh, in the wild. You know, I think 12 would be a pretty old beaver. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the typical colony or family is, you know, you'll, you'll see, uh, you know, up to eight or so beavers. And, and again, that's the, uh, you know, the, the mating pair who mate for life, the male and the female. And then you've got, you know, three year classes of, of brothers and sisters all kind of living together in the, in the lodge. And do, do the uh, younger beavers ever uh, push the older ones out of their positions of power uh, <laughs> as some animals do, you know, like prides of lions or, or do they just happily coexist for, for their lifespan? Yeah, you know, they, I mean, they definitely for, you know, for a couple of, at least for a couple of years, you know, those, those, those brothers and sisters, those siblings are all living together. And actually, you know, they're the, the, the younger beavers will follow and, and mimic the, the older beavers, you know, they're clearly learning from their, their older siblings to an extent. Um, and then again, you know, during their sometime at some time during their second year, you know, those two year old older siblings will disperse. Um, right. And, you know, I'm not sure that it's known whether they're you know, their leaving of their own volition or, or um, you know, actively uh, being pushed out by the younger ones. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good question. And I, I'm not sure that uh, the answer is really known. Uh, do beavers uh, live along uh, larger rivers? Uh, oh, we have a couple of questions about that. Yeah, they, they absolutely do. You know, I think that one, one important thing to remember is, you know, you, of course you hear the phrase, busy as a beaver, right? Like they're, you know, these, these fanatical workers. But you know they're not. I think that they're 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 not just busy for the sake of busyness, right? They're you know they're building dams to create these nice deep pockets of water where they can be safe. But if those deep pockets of water already exist, then they're happy, right? So they'll you know they'll they'll live very happily in in big lakes and big rivers. You know I've seen I've seen beavers at the bottom of the Colorado River and in the Grand Canyon. You know and they're certainly not building dams in there. Um, so yeah, they're you know they're they're um, you know they're they're happy and maybe even happier uh, in these you know these big bodies of water where they're not um, you know, they don't have to work very hard. I have a couple of questions about uh, people disturbing beavers. If you know would motorized or or foot traffic near beaver lodges disrupt what they're doing, or would they be pretty unconcerned with that? Yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good question. You know, and it really depends on the on the colony. I mean, they you know they they do they definitely acclimate to to people over time. Um, you know, I, my my wife and I used to live in in Northampton. I think I, I mentioned that. And uh, there's a place there uh, called called Lake Fitzgerald, this little conservation area. And there's this this really big beaver lodge right on the shore. Um, and it's you know it's been there since the 1950s, according to some locals. And uh, and there, um, you know, you can go there at an evening and actually see people standing on top of the lodge and bass fishing while the beavers will be out and maintaining the other side of the lodge, you know, 10, 10 feet away. It's really unbelievable. So that's, you know, that's, that's clearly a population of beavers that's been around people for a very long time and has, has habituated to them, you know, and then you see other colonies um, that, uh, you know, that, that freak out whenever you, you know, get within 100 feet of them. Um, so, you know, they've, you know, they've got personalities and, they, you know, they've habituated to, uh, to people in, in different, different ways. So we have a question. Sorry, we have a question about uh, muskrats and whether they uh, chew down trees. Could they be culprits of uh, felled trees? Yeah, no, mus muskrats do not uh, chew down trees. That's so. If you've got trees that have been chewed down, that's a that's a beaver. No, nothing else is is really uh, is really doing that. You know, muskrats do build little lodges, which some of you have probably seen. But those are you know those are made from. Uh, grass and mud, typically not not uh, not gnawed sticks. Um, so they do build lodges, but you know only beavers build dams. Only beavers fell fell trees. Um, and you know often uh, people often say um, you know like people send me lots of videos of uh, you know of the, the baby beavers they see swimming around, and and those baby beavers are almost always muskrats. Um, you know, and a very easy way to tell is that you know of course beavers have this you know this wonderful paddle tail, whereas muskrats have a you know kind of a a rat-like tail, um, and you know, muskrats use their tail to swim, unlike beavers. So if you see a little sort of like propeller-like tail behind the, 
the aquatic rodent that you're watching. That's a, that's a, a muskrat. I have a question about predators. If, uh, if beavers are introduced, uh, will this, uh, you know, boost the population of predators uh, with perhaps unintended consequences? Yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a good, a good question. Um, you know, predators it, like cougars and wolves. Right, right. I mean, you know, certainly, you know, which certainly were obviously native, native species in, in, in Maine. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, so a, cu a couple of points, you know, one, one common question is, you know, in places like New England, where that, you know, there aren't a lot of native predators, you know, are beavers going to proliferate wildly? You know, do, do, do they need predators to control their populations? Um, you know, and the answer to that is, is pretty clearly no. Um, you know, they, they, they basically, you know, they're very dependent on the amount of available habitat and the amount of available food. And that's, you know, that's really what determines their, their population levels, not, not predation. Um, but, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, you know, cougars and cougars and wolves are, are uh, you know, part of, part of the historic landscape for sure. And, and, uh, you know, would probably do a lot of good in reducing white-tailed deer populations, which are, you know, certainly overpopulated on the East Coast. So I'm all, I'm all for bringing back cougars and wolves to uh, all of their, their native range. Great. Well, I have, uh, this, this is a comment, does not qualify as a question, but someone wrote, uh, I loved reading your book. What a great work. I learned so much. It should be required reading for everyone. Oh, wonderful. Well, so, I, that. <laughs> so, so just wanted to toss that in. Uh, I think that covers most of the questions we have. Thank you yeah. so much for, for joining us tonight. Do you have any further? Do you have a, uh, I'm sorry, I should know this, but do you have a website? Um, do. yeah it's it's uh, it's you know ben bengoldfarb.com and um again you know i put i put my uh my my email address uh in the chat so if you're interested in talking more about beavers that didn't get to your question um or uh, you know if you're interested in in a signed book just drop drop me a line and we'd love to hear from you yes well thank you so much for joining us and maybe we'll see you in maine again sometime and uh we want to send every all our viewers out there our best wishes for the upcoming holiday season, and we'll see you in the new year. Uh, Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Good night, everyone. Take care.